In this new series, we shall explore the topic, starting off with one of the oldest belief systems, one of the oldest mythos to have spawned out of fantasy and wonder. We look back to the Norse to see how their gods of old still influence your daily life and culture. Explore this history with you and how it is still impact our media. Technical difficulties, so you guys distract him for now. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Ah, uh, distracting. Uh, what kind of technical difficulties? Oh, there we go. Of? There we go. No, I've been using this thing, new thing called uh, VCAM, and it's horrible um, on your memory for your computer. So today, we have a great panel with us, and we're going to be talking about food and wine of the Vikings and the Norse people, and it's going to give us a great insight to how they ate, what did they drink, why did they drink it, and we have only an hour, so we're going to go into it, and I think we have an hour, and uh, we're going to jump right into it. I said I was going to start off here getting into talking about mead and drinking and wine, so let me just queue up the um, footage that I have for us here. Oh, a second. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Drew, before I do that? Mm, I don't think so. Besides the fact that your camera looks like a big symbol to me. My camera's what? Your camera looks like a big webcam uh, logo symbol. Oh, I know why that is. Hold on a second. Okay. I didn't know if that was an issue or not. No, but you can use this. Now you can see the stream instead. Uh, hey, that's much better. Okay. Yeah, now you can see what I see. You can see what everybody sees now. Okay. Well, so I think one of the things before we jump into it, uh, the last time we did this, it was the three of us. This time we also have Justin online. So, Justin, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit or? Don't have a lot of background, to be honest. I studied a little bit of different religions back in high school, but never got into the Norse. My uncle studied mythology before he passed away, but don't have a tremendous amount of background. So if I do, I do. If I don't, I don't. That's okay. Chime in with what you want to say then. Right on. I mean, uh, we do tend to interject one another a bit. <laughs> so. Right on. Okay, I'm going to get into it. I'm going to talk a little bit about mead, and then, you know, I'm sure there's going to be things that you guys want to talk about once I bring this up. So I'm just going to pull up here. I have a little map here, and we'll start from there. I have some notes here. Stop. <laughs> All right. I didn't want me to go that far. Okay, here we are. All right, so <clears throat> what I want to talk about mead because, you know, mead is the bloodline, I would say, of the Vikings, right? And it wasn't just mead they loved to make. They loved to brew beer. They brewed wine, and they brewed mead. Right, so mead was just one of the things they brewed. But, um, but right, was that one of their, their their wine was different? It was mostly fruit fruit wines, not grape based wines. Correct. But they imported a lot of grape wine. Correct. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And but we all know the Vikings for drinking mead, and I think um, a lot of modern day. Uh, shows have popularized it, such as Game of Thrones and, and all these, the the Viking show on, on Netflix, if you want to uh, say you. Uh, so, mead has been coming back. But mead is probably the oldest um, fermented beverage in the world to date by any chronological order that we could find. And actually, the oldest records of it are in Asia, just because... You know, in, in the Scandinavian countries, they didn't really keep great records of this history as much as the um, Asian countries did. A lot of it was lost in time. So the only real references to Tama that we have actually comes from Asia. And due to that evidence, we could track mead 
as of right now, going back 10,000 years, making it the oldest uh, fermented beverage in the world. Now, with that being said, you know, they, they used to make it, but it wasn't really something they drank every day just because it was expensive. They did drink some sort of mead. They did drink some sort of mead, but the mead that you would see um, inside um, what you would call mead halls, that's what this is, uh, this is it's called a mead hall. Um, the type of mead that you will find in a mead hall, you would not be drinking every day. You would be drinking it for special occasions like rituals or feasts or parties. You wouldn't be drinking it as a everyday beverage because it's so expensive to make. Um, and when the Vikings really came to um, making the mead, they really had to make sure they used all the honey that would possibly was inside that hive because it was so valuable to them. It was so hard to make. Uh, the actual process itself, though, for making mead wasn't difficult at all. In fact, um, mead is probably the easiest fermented beverage to make. There's not a picture of a, another uh, mead hall there. But mead itself... Um, Mead itself is not difficult to make. Uh, all you need to do to make mead is, quite frankly, you just need the honey, you need some water, and yeast, and that's it. And quite frankly, people sometimes complain that mead could be too sweet. It may taste like honey, um, but in fact, mead is so versatile that uh, it could be sweet or it could be dry. And attending, uh, depending on how far you go on that spectrum on the sweet or dry side depends how much honey you actually taste. And the more dry you go for your meat, the less it tastes like honey and more like alcohol. And a lot of times people like to use things like berries, like edelberries or or blueberries, raspberries. They like to use different grains and uh, fruits to really flavor the mead. And because of this, mead can have a very wide disparity of alcohol by volume. I mean, it could go from 8% all the way to 20 percent it could go from a beer to all the way to a wine and alcohol content that's why it varies so much and really that has to do with the dryness and ten you tend to find that the drier the mead the higher the alcohol uh, by volume there is just because there's more alcohol and less sugar in the beverage um well, next up. so going to the going to the honey collection these days, you know, you go to a honey farm and, you know, they have these reusable um, plates that they use these days. Um, so you take it out, you get you get the honey and the comb off of it, and you put it back into the hive. And the bees start over. You don't have to, you don't have to discard anything. Everything's there. But back in the days of the Vikings, they used to use these sort of uh, devices to extract the honey. And it's a little hive they made. And the bees would go inside. I'm just trying to stop it. Okay. The bees would go inside and they would make their honeycombs inside of this and and make their um, honey inside this device. And what the Vikings used to do is they used to take this device and extract the honey, right, um, outside of it. Um, and that would make your high-grade mead that you would drink inside the mead halls, um, but there would still be honey left over on the material of this hay. So they didn't want it to make it go to waste. They used everything. So the leftovers, what they would do after they extract all the honey from the combs to make the high quality meat that they would drink in some of the meat halls, they would take the actual hive itself and the, and the hay basket and they would boil it. And what they do is with that, that that mead water they would call it they would use to make lower quality meads that you could drink on more of a daily basis compared to your higher quality mead that you would drink inside the halls it was a different type of quality it was more like of a common case and of course you know a lot of people they didn't go that route they just go into the woods and find regular hives and extract it that way but they made sure to use everything they can to get the most out of the um honey that they procured because like I said it's a it's a really expensive process to serve the B side now 
The horn, the drinking horn, is probably the most traditional way to drink your mead. And the reason being is one, just for one thing, which is they expected you, um, when you were to pour someone a glass, uh, let me pause this, if you were to pour someone some mead inside um, one of these drinking horns, you were expected to finish it in your sitting. Meaning... Because there's no way you could put this down. I'm not sure if you could see that. There's no way to put it down on the table. It's on a cup. So it was expected of you if you were at a feast or a festival or a ritual that if you got that drinking horn, you can't put it down or do anything else until you finish it. So, and, and that's where uh, <laughs> a lot of the rituals came from and why drinking horns play such a big social element in the Viking culture. Um... Of course, people sometimes use wine glasses these days, or they'll use like a goblet or some sort. You know, those are more of the newer sort of uh, ways you could drink it, uh, which is fine. But, you know, it's important to realize that when you pour some of a glass of mead, they expected you to finish that glass of mead in your sitting and not to do anything else till it's finished. So that's sort of like the traditional expectation. Um, here's some other cups, a different type of cup that was procured later on uh, as an alternative to the drinking horn. Uh, let's see. What was it? Ah. Oh, yeah, I have some here. Let's fast forward. Yeah. So, there we are. Let's go here. So, in the Hall of Odin, um, you will be served mead um, on a daily basis. So, you would fight during the day, and at night, you would drink mead, the finest mead, and you would eat your fill of food. Oh, at, specifically in Valhalla. Yes, in Valhalla. Yeah. Specifically Valhalla. That's, that's the Hall uh, of Odin. Um, where you would go and basically any warrior that was deemed um, worthy after a battle will be picked up on the Valkyries and brought to Odin's Hall called Valhalla where uh, you would be expected to fight at the end of days in Ragnarok on the side of Odin. But until then, until that point in time, you would have to eat every night great food and drink mead and the other day you would do nothing but fight for fun and uh now i'm forgetting the name of this creature i wrote everything else down but that <laughs> but um i should probably look it up but that's pretty much it and you know it's funny because mead has played such an important role in the culture of the vikings um and Norse mythology that it permeates through everything. And there are other stories where, you know, they talk about um, Odin having a, a vat of mead that could give you the wisdom of the gift of word. So, you know, and that's a story on itself that we're going to go into. But it, it permeates through so many things. And it, you see how important it is by just how much lore integrates it into its uh, history. The stories of Thor drinking a insurmountable horn of mead that eventually drained the world's oceans. You know, there's so many stories um, about it that it's probably... I chose to talk about that for now just because I knew it was... I think it took me like 10 minutes to go through that, but mead is probably the most important and influential beverage in history. Um, and... I hope you guys learned a little bit more about it from me talking about it there. Right. I think uh, one of the other things that a lot of people um, kind of forget about, too, is when they when they used to drink, they also had lots of ales because they had barley and wheat and other things. And most of what they did was they just had to use whatever resources they had because as we right. talked a little bit about last time, um, 
they didn't have a lot of resources in, in the area that they lived. It was hard to grow a lot of crops. And so um, they, they had to kind of make do with what they had. But one of the most important things and one of the reasons why they made they they used all of the parts of the hunt uh, the beehive and um the the protective baskets was because you had to somehow purify quote unquote the water um and make it safe to drink and one of the easiest ways to do that was to increase a bit of an alcohol content so that you could actually consume without worrying about any bacteria that was inside the fluid that you were consuming um, so they did drink a lot of this really fine weed that, uh, uh, sorry, fine mead that was, um, a little bit higher alcohol content, um, in their celebrations and in their meat halls and in their, uh, main feasts. But even during everyday usage, they drank a lot of, um, ales made out of barley and wheat. And then they also drank a lot of the, um, the not as high grade mead specifically because they just needed to consume fluids and that was the only way that they could do that without having to worry about some sort of sicknesses um one of the other things that i found that i thought was particularly interesting was along with those baskets uh if they found um relatively large beehives uh out and about they actually built these kind of pyramid looking cones um that they would put around it to protect the hive so that only the bees could get in and other animals couldn't um, to eat the honey or whatever else. And if an animal, the, the hole was large enough that some animals were able to get in there and that would just be a little bit of extra food that they would have. Um, but they, they had a lot of different ways to protect it. Um, and I always thought that was kind of pretty cool. Yeah, I was gonna mention the, the conical stone towers that they would build around the uh, wicker huts for the wicker beehives right uh, <clears throat> it is very very interesting very cool for a long time apparently archaeologists thought they were uh wolf traps before they figured out exactly what it was to be used for and it wasn't until they found those same type of uh stone conical structures um in other parts of the world where they actually put together what the specific purpose of of those cones was that they I thought it was wolf traps and they couldn't figure out you know exactly how that would work and how it was efficient until several other cultures kind of adopted a similar pattern to protect their their beehives so that they could have honey and they could have sugars um, to cook and to um, produce different types of alcohols that they figured out what exactly the purpose was. Yep. Uh, something along the lines of their technology for brewing that I found was kind of cool is that in order to very gently and specifically monitor the amount of heat that they were putting into it during the uh, brewing process in order to get it to boil, instead of sticking it in a cast iron or even soapstone pot over fire, they would superheat stones and throw them in it. Yeah. So that was uh, kind of a tricky way to very easily measure the heat and redistribute it. Right. And, and we can talk a little bit more about that later because they used it in cooking foods as well. The, the hot stones were a pretty common way because um, it was a more efficient way to keep fluid. You know. But I think we... Uh, like in today's world, we have a lot of times where people think, oh, Vikings, and they think of drinking out of mead horns, um, but and drinking mead out of horns. And they, they did have ales and they did have other alcohols. And as we talked a little bit about before, um, they did make wines um, in the traditional sense with grapes as well as fruit wines um, by trading with other cultures. Um, and by trading, I mean going and killing a bunch of people <laughs> and taking their resources. There, there, was, they, there was some there was trade. Too. <laughs> um, one of the things that struck me as particularly interesting and um, because the production of meat and the production of ale was very important, um, not only in uh, feasts and uh, 
uh, general social patterns, but also in just everyday health of being able to consume liquids, that this was something that was trusted primarily to the women, that they were, they were smart enough and capable enough to make sure they did it without wasting materials. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, anyway. Um, but the, the production of mead and the production of ales was very important, not only just for celebratory reasons, but also just for everyday use. So, um, and then one other thing, and this is something that is kind of a myth that may or may not be true, but um, they did also use goblets because, um, like, like Frank was mentioning, you can't set the horn down. You have to consume it all at once, and they didn't always want to drink completely, but one of the things they did, whether it was a horn or um, a goblet or whatever, was when they would cheers each other, part of what they did to make sure that they weren't being poisoned was you always had to cheers because, and you cheers aggressively so that some of your fluid ended up in other people's drinks and other people's drinks ended up in yours so that if anyone was being poisoned, we were all being poisoned. And if someone wasn't willing to cheers their beverages, that that meant that they were probably trying to poison you. So um, I feel like that's maybe a little bit off topic, but still a tidbit about about alcohol or drink consumption that they had back in the day that um, they, they just had built in social norms that it wasn't that they were super aggressive and just loud and boisterous and therefore cheers very aggressively. Um, there was actually a purpose to it that made it just a social norm um, that if you weren't doing that, then you were the odd one. Mm. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, does anybody have anybody anything else to add to uh, to beverages and production of beverages? Mm. I do have. Uh... A Nordic saying attributed to Heimdall about drink. Sure. I say, let's go for it. Let's hear it. And, uh, less good than they say for the sons of men is the drink, to drink of the ale. For the more they drink, the less they think and keep watch over their wits. Drunk was I till then. I was over drunk in the fold of the wise follier, but best is the ale feast when a man is able to call back his wits all at once. So don't overdo it. <laughs> That's what that means right there. Yeah. <laughs> attributed to a saying from Heimdall. I, I feel like the wits coming back is pretty much just the hangover that they all felt the next day. Yeah. Like, oh, that was a bad idea. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, the wit's coming back. You guys remember? <laughs> We're smart again. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't drink all the alcohol. All right. <laughs> yeah, I think you guys touched on a lot of the stuff I wanted to talk about uh, after that. So I think, I think I'm okay moving on if you guys want to move on to the next topic. Sure. So, do we want to talk about briefly the cooking devices and implements or straight to the food itself? I, I personally think that if we kind of talk about the food itself, we'll, we'll get there. Um, because, I mean, part of, part of what they did um, in, in using all of their resources was they did a lot of eating stews and other things. And so, as, as we get to that, we can talk about um, the materials they use to, to make the food. Okay. Uh, somebody want to talk about first the different casts and the fact that these pretty much three different casts they had. Cast might not be the right word for the culture, but let's say wealth levels that each one of them had a different stereotypical spread of food. Why don't you kick that off? All right. Um, so everybody, everybody had bread. Everybody made bread of different varieties. And the more purified the uh, uh, flour and the more flour in the bread, 
obviously that was, you know, higher class, higher level. And the heartiest bread that was really, really packed full of nuts and grain and would sit on you like a horrendous brick was for the lower class to, well, because it was more available, affordable, easily forgeable, but also gave you more effort power for farming. And as far as meats go, you would, in the inverse to our modern culture, the lower class ate a ton of mollusks, oysters, and those kinds of little, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Bivalves. Bivalve creatures. Yeah, there you go. So that, I mean, the because of their culture being seafaring, lots of fish. So that was easily available for everyone. And that's why the lower class had the most seafood available. And it also meant less preserving actual red meats. Correct, yeah. So um, preserving preserving the fishes um, and preserving the bivalves and things, um, even though we all think of fish as something that goes bad after like one or two you know days um it was actually a lot easier for them to dry it out and preserve it uh than some of the red meats because it essentially um expelled moisture very quickly when it was hung up to dry so there wasn't a lot of extra effort going into um pr preserving those meats one of the things i do want to touch on before uh we move away from it is um, the bread that we're talking about is very different than the bread that we have today. Um, bread back then essentially had to be eaten directly after it was baked, and it had to be ba baked fresh because otherwise it turned almost rock hard because they didn't have all these extra things to make the bread very um, fluffy and, and, and light. I, I don't know that bread's very light now, but comparatively it was much heavier then. And... Um, so they had these rolls that were almost, they, they were just almost like dense bricks that when they were warm, you could consume them. But when they were cold, you couldn't. And um, in lower class places uh, and during the winter and stuff uh, where they didn't have as much access to um, fruits and other things that would help with vitamin C, one of the things they did was instead of using flour, they actually ground up. I'm trying to remember if it was the bark or the actual tree itself, but they would grind up pine, either pine or pine bark, as their base flour to make this bread, um, which actually had a very large amount of vitamin C. Not that I imagine they knew that in that day, but they, they did a lot to make sure that they had a relatively balanced and healthy diet, um, just in general practice. And uh, I mean, if anyone came to me and was like, hey, do you want some of this bread made out of a tree? I'd probably be like, nah, man, you can keep it. But they, they had to do that then. And um, I mean, they were, they were very creative in making sure that they used all the resources that they could. And Frank, I think I sent you a picture of uh, two bread roll loaves sitting on a... Uh, Pan? Skillet. Yeah, I already have it up. Oh, you do? If you look at my uh, camera... You can see it. Oh, yep. That's what we're talking about. Yep. Sorry. Yeah, I already pulled it up while he's talking about it. Okay. <laughs> so that's kind of what their their bread was. I mean, it was it was more of a um, uh, almost it was a flatbread, really. Um, it, it wasn't fluffy or light. They didn't have any sort of rising to their bread, um, but they would make dough and store it, and then just heat it up quickly and cook it like that. Sometimes on a pan, sometimes on straight fire. Um, so you'd get a little bit of ash on there, I guess, for extra seasoning. But I didn't come across any mention of an a enclosed oven style thing. Everything was seems to have been over the fire or in pots. Do you wonder right. how much how this must taste? I eat all, all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, with, the, with, the, with the pine tree too, I'd try it. Sure. I mean. I, I love gum mastic, so I trust. <laughs> <laughs> I was I'm just curious now. So, but like you have to eat it. It makes sense, right? It's coming off the pan. It's hot. It's soft still because it's just cooked. But I wonder. For me, it looks more like it's cooked almost like a pancake. 
can a piece of bread where it's rising it has a direct contact where you know similar to a pancake it goes dry after a day and hard <laughs> it almost looks like a pita I don't it know. does look like a pita you're right it does look more like a pita I want to try this now we have to have uh, Steven cook us this bread yes. live Yes. Yeah, I'll have to make some dough and send it out to you guys so you can make it over a flat pan. If I send you pre-cooked bread, it won't work. But um, but I, I thought that was particularly interesting. I mean, um, just, the, just the almost, I guess, creativity to make sure that they got the nutrients that they needed to be healthy um, and, and make sure that they were fed enough is, is particularly interesting to me. Yeah. Um, but I think along with that, one of the things that a lot of people probably could expect is um, they had a lot of dairy products and cheeses out there, too, because um, a lot of the protein that they had came from animals. So they, they pretty much ate any animal that they get it, get their hands on. Um, but Horses specific. Go ahead. Horses and dogs, too. Yeah, they ate horses and dogs. They ate a lot of goat. Um, they did occasionally have beef, um, lots of lamb, um, because those were the animals that could survive in, in the uh, environment that they were in. Because um, I think some people kind of forget just how far north and how cold most of the year is uh, for, for the lands that they were in. Even when they, you know, conquered certain places in England, England is a, a cold and dreary place. Um, and so they they pretty much effectively used the resources that they had to make sure that they they could consume what they needed to um and they had lots of stews because you could have boiled fluids that were um were healthy enough to eat um and it was a very effective and efficient way to uh cook down vegetables and meats all together because you know after a day of farming since the sun came up you don't really want to have to sit and prepare a really fancy dinner Absolutely, and let's not forget about the uh, meat that drew them to settle there way back in the beginning that eventually became a meat for the nobility because they had the time, the resources, etc., and owned the land to go hunting for reindeer. Right. So, lots and lots of reindeer meat going around, but eventually with the uh, classes being divided further and further a long time it became that was the food for the upper middle class and the upper class because again they were now in possession of the hunting grounds themselves they have like a showing of the platters ah so i think one other thing and this is kind of off topic on food but something that is relevant is um, as we're talking about classes and different things, the Vikings did have slaves, but it, it wasn't slaves in the sense that um, of, of what we talk about uh, it, when we're talking about like American history or whatever. Um, yeah. The slaves were paid. They were um, relatively valued. They just didn't have the ability to do things like vote um, whenever there was some sort of uh, community gathering or anything like that. Um, but they, you know, they were they were kind of the lower class. It, it wasn't necessarily that they were slaves in the sense of that they were um, owned and not paid and and treated poorly. Um, they were relative. They were normally treated um, kind of as family. They were still owned by a particular family, but they were really kind of making up the the lower class. So, perhaps the, a better word for that in that area and culture would be thrall. Right. Yeah. And uh, they were the ones, you know, they were given the hardest labor, such as actually grinding the uh, sometimes flour that they had, definitely the nuts and seeds and everything else that went into baking. And I think Frank has a picture of the millstones that they used. I do. I'll say it. Had a hole in the top where you fed everything and it came out of the sieve like cuts in the bottom stone and it was pretty much pushing one slightly pivoted giant rock around another yeah i have it right here i'll pull up okay and well and 
that that's one other thing about it is every once in a while while you're eating bread like you just get a chunk of rock exactly uh, how coarse and ridiculous these millstones seem to be <laughs> and uh there yeah. we that, that's a good image of it and there was no i would have thought in my mind they would have you know set a wheel on it put an animal on the outside and make it walk around but no it seems to be the uh the thralls and possibly the punished children that got to do this so you would actually get a piece of rock. I'm just showing the other side really quick. I'll move you guys there. So they return this and build the flower down. And you said they used to get pieces of rock in their bread. Yeah. So um, I mean, essentially, like when you're when you're grinding, and you have rock against rock, every once in a while you get a rock chip in there. And when they were when they the flower or meal or whatever that was coming out of it was. Um, was coming out they would try and sort it but you pretty regularly got um a uh, uh at least some some fine ground stone if not a couple of chunks of rock that you just consumed um that was that was just normal uh situations and obviously whenever somebody had more money um they were uh, uh of higher stature they could pay someone to sort through it and do a couple of extra uh Sieve, yeah, sieving um, passes to make sure that that didn't come through as much. But it was it was pretty common for people to just consume parts of rock or, you know, take a bite and just take it out and keep eating. And that kind of uh, is reflected in all the skulls in the archaeology when they say, hey, they had really good teeth. I mean, they didn't rot, they didn't decay, they didn't have high fructose corn syrup to eat. But they did have a lot of wear on their teeth. And one of the assumptions is because they would have these little chips of rock in their bread. I mean, I could uh, understand why. I have an picture here that was pretty cool. Let me see. Of a millstone. This one's really cool because I, 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 it makes you wonder, like, where they were doing this stuff. And for me, like, something like this seems like something would be. Hmm. That's a millstone too, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, looks like it. So, I mean, they they had really creative ways to, again, use the resources that they had to accomplish what they needed to. Um, but moving on from bread and back to meat a little bit, I mean, they, they did a lot. I mean, it was pretty standard to have things like stew um, along with their bread. And um, they, they specifically a it, it, in in all of the records and and poems and things that they have they ate a lot of uh two meals a day so they had day meal and they had night meal and day meal was normally in the morning after you got up and did some some work out on the farm or whatever and then you came back and then you ate and then you had night meal which was your and most of the time day meal was like porridge or something easier leftovers um and the night meal was going to be when you had more meat and more fresh bread um and stews and things that uh and there's a picture a wonderful picture of a, a cauldron on with some stew on it um but they would um produce that more for night meals and then most of the time during the day they would consume essentially just leftovers of that and then they would make fresh bread and fresh uh a fresh meal for their evening meal um whether it was a celebration or not and, and looking at these uh, cast iron cauldrons and pots and things makes me think of something that, that just, for me, it blew my mind when I was looking it up and researching it because I would never thought of this. But they also used quite a bit of soapstone bowls, pots, and cookery. Right, because metal was very expensive. Um, it, it was not an easily accessed resource. That was one of the things that they kind of traded for and took from other places and that was one of the reasons that metal was so valuable but um a pot like you know most of the higher class people would cook in all pots but most of the lower class people um would be cooking in soapstones and and pottery instead yeah i think i think uh frank might have a picture of the soapstone little jar that I, have was a, used. I have two your jar i think and 
Let's see. This one here? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. So, I mean, for this, you pack it with your uh, forged, as you said, they use everything, forged greens, and be able to melt them down into a mush for uh, either serving on top of meat or as a side on all its own. Have another right. picture here of a soapstone bowl. And uh, on the topic of meat again, uh, talking about pigs, pigs and bacon, for the super higher class, the the landlords and such, that was a relatively common food item. But most of the middle to lower class, and I'm not talking as low as thralls, uh, had a pig they kept year round in a way until you got to winter. And that would then, once it was big enough in winter, it would be slaughtered, and that would be your preserved meat over the winter. Which may or may not be where the, the whole concept of cured bacon comes from. Mm -hmm. They cured a lot of these meats. Um, so even if you didn't have the ability to cook it, you still had something that you could eat in the winter. And one other thing, go ahead. I was going to say, there's uh, where we get some of the origins of having uh, pork for Yule. That that was my introduction. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> um, one of the other things, and I know we touched on it a little bit, um, but because of just the, the situation that they were in, and especially in the winter, it was actually really hard for them to have a lot of little fires um, for them to cook in or cook over. And so what they actually did was they had several large fires that they had stones that were just heating all the time. So a lot of these things were cooked by placing um, a number of hot stones inside some sort of fluid or inside the, the vegetables to cook it down so that you could um, still cook even if you didn't have necessarily access to fire. That being said, um, there was in most homes a place where they had a fire to keep the home warm in the center of the, the house that they would hang uh, either soapstone pots or cast iron pots um, from above that would essentially um, let you cook from home regardless of what whatever, whatever else was going on outside and anything else. Because they were continuously absorbing heat and hanging there and being little radiators, yeah. Right, they were radiators. They were better at uh, at heating the home as well, and um, and uh, the dispersing that heat specifically. Um, but there there was actually uh, an interesting story, and I'm trying to remember who it was. But one of the um, the the main I don't want to say it wasn't a king, but one of the people that was uh, in charge of one of the areas, he actually had his home pot specifically set up as a trap that if anyone tried to come into his home and tried to assassinate him at night, it would make a whole lot of noise and wake him up. So he knew that he was being attacked. So they were, they were able to use their cooking materials as uh, safety. Home security. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll have to find that information and we can link it to it uh, later or something, but um that worked right up until the people who were trying to kill him figured out what was happening because one of the guys made it out alive and and uh, so then he he didn't last very long after that because they were able to disarm his safety but um they they were able to use their cooking materials for more than just cooking as well yep <clears throat> Uh, I'm, I'm trying to filter through uh, everything and figure out what hasn't been said yet. Mm. Okay, how about we... You guys talked about bread, right? And mm -hmm. uh, the type of meat they normally eat, which is reindeer, right? They used to, uh, that was their typical food. Um, 
lots of birds too. Lots of birds. Fe uh, pigeons, and things of that nature. So, I guess. How about the feast? Because I think the feast is probably like the biggest meal that a Viking could have in a year. What do they normally hold them for? Uh, the, you mean each uh, solstice celebration feast? Specifically? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't do a whole lot of looking into that myself. But I mean, I, I I know one of the biggest ones is um, like the Yule time, and it was and it was more of uh, not necessarily. I mean, I mean they would have feasts to celebrate, um, but it wasn't necessarily like holding specifically for a feast. They would harvest grains, and um, they they would have uh, lots of stores of cured meats in various different types of vats. Um, whether it be cured with salt or just dried or whatever, um, just to survive the winter. Because the winter was long and harsh and they had to do what they could. And, and as was mentioned, a lot of people held on to, you know, a couple extra farm animals that could survive the winter and hopefully not have to go into that. But they would, they would dig into those live stores, if you want to call it, um, to make sure that they were all fed. One of the other things that, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but um, one of one of the, the patterns that still can, carries through today that was true in most pagan traditions was um, they did a lot of um, sacrificing around um, um, Samhain, which was like what we consider now Halloween. Um, and that's where a lot of the blood and guts and gore idea of Halloween comes from is there, there was two things. One, um, that was the time of year when there was the least, uh, the, there was the thinnest veil between the, the living and the dead. But also, that was also just the time of year where they had to go through all their livestock and go, these aren't going to survive the winter, these will, and decide, and then slaughter and cure all of that meat so that they could survive through the winter. And that's another reason why it also, Samhain also doubled as their new year. Because everything was going to be new. Out with the old. Right. Did that kind of touch on what you were getting at, Frank? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, exactly hit on what I wanted. You know, I think when it comes to feasts, you, you have to remember that the Vikings and it's funny because I think you hit on it, Drew, last time. The word Viking, I keep, is a misnomer because it's really just a description of what someone is doing. They're really, they're Nordic. That's what they are. So, you know, Nordic food is Viking food. So, like, <laughs> so um, when the Nordic people held feasts, it wasn't just anyone that did it. It was just the really rich and wealthy that could do it, uh, that would host it uh, for, for the village and, and just, like, Stephen and Drew was saying it would be for feasts like the Winter Nights, Jewel, Harvest Festivals, uh, religious festivals, maybe there's a wedding, or maybe they had a successful voyage and they came back and now and now they're doing a celebration. Um, you know, so, you know, religion in Nordic countries was not very hierarchical. So, like in Christianity, it's very hierarchical. There's a order. There's a there's a chart. There's a pecking order. In uh, Norse mythology, the religion, um, most religious observations for the rich for the festivals were done in a communal or family oriented um, setting. Yeah. So that's why the Viking feasts, whenever you see depictions of it always look very like joyous and communal and uh everybody's gather around a big table drinking together um getting drunk <laughs> you know yeah, it's not like the city or, or galdir aficionado would uh orchestrate it it wasn't that kind of a religious based celebration right exactly so it was more of a communal um celebration so you know, 
the thing is also a lot of people don't understand that a lot of these feasts when they used to hold them would not happen just one day they would um they would have a feast that would last three days four days five days sometimes 12 days for major feasts you know so you know um until the food was gone <laughs> yeah yeah so like the winter solstice uh they celebrated the i think it's called jewel and it's jewel, from Dece yeah. december 20th to the 31st mm -hmm. and every single day they're celebrating from december 20th to december 31st they're celebrating um you know and then august and september were like harvest festivals because that's when the foods were ready to eat they're ready to pick um, and then they were, you know, preserving them for the winter, and a lot of times in the autumn is when a lot of people did their weddings, um, uh, because it was during a time where people weren't really doing anything. The harvest is over, things are prepared for winter already, it's a good time to have a wedding. So, <laughs> you know, um, the towns would gather all the food for these festivals, and they'll have the long trestle tables, and they'll bring up the benches, because... They use benches for a reason. They didn't use chairs because it was a very communal exercise. So they wanted people to feel invited. And a bench feels inviting. Chairs are limited. Same. Yeah, exactly. There's only so many you can sit there. So, and when they brought out, um, when they brought out the wine and the mead, they brought them in vats, like big jugs. And they put them on the table. And uh, you already had your drinking horns. So you don't need a cup. Pull your drink, your whore. Maybe they did have some custom, maybe it's ceremonial, um, you know. And you'll be drinking to the gods, you'll drink to your local chief, you then you drink to the guys that made the voyage successful, or the newlyweds. You'll find something to drink to, and you know, um, you know, there was a long history of where you know, poets and singers and uh, would write long stories of these legendary feasts and. Um, you would hear about them and how great they were and how joyous and how long and hard the feasting was and, you know, and it's where, like, gods like Thor got their big appetite where you would read about them eating for days of huge oxen and <laughs> so, you know, I just wanted to touch it on it because I, I think the feasting, uh, par for me was always something that took me by surprise because... It's something when you read about it, it threw me off. Like I hear about these feasts in a trestle, uh, with the trestle tables and, and everybody joining in together. And I thought, Hey, okay, that's cool. But then we read, it's like, okay, these lasted average a week. <laughs> like what were they doing? What well, drew like what Steve, like uh, uh, just they were drinking and eating. I mean, and and one of the things is like uh and this is kind of counter to to the the uh phrase and and saying um that drew was talking about but like during feasts especially like because of the design of the horn or whatever you were supposed to consume as much as possible mm -hmm. i mean you were supposed to consume as much food as much drink you were just supposed to get hammered and super chubby like ready to go for whatever was going to come afterwards because among other things you had the resources to do so at the time hmm. and there was no guarantee those resources were going to be there later so pack on the fat yeah Absolutely. one other thing that i found particularly interesting um more about like their their eating habits was um, if you try and look at the nutrients that they have based on what we consume um in terms of caloric calorie or uh, caloric intake every day um it, it looked like they were relatively balanced um they were normally a little bit short on vitamin c and a couple other vitamins and minerals but back in those times i mean they just consumed I mean, even farmers that weren't uh, very well off, it was it was pretty standard for them to consume between five and ten thousand calories a day because of the work that they were doing. And so, um, by the time you consumed that much food, you're you're able to meet all of all of the dietary needs that you you have from the food that they had available. 
but in the winter uh among other things people weren't working as hard or whatever but they kind of had to pack on the pounds and and that was one of the things that these feasts helped with um and consuming lots of alcoholic beverages because they had a lot of calories in them and um let's not forget that's like let's not forget that the whole saying and this is what bewilders me and uh, about this history of the vikings and nordic people and norse mythology is quite literally the jewel festival I already mentioned the dates it was um you know those 12 days before christmas right 12 days of christmas yeah. that's where the saying the 12 days of christmas come from is from the vikings the nordic the norse mythology and quite oh. frankly they believe you know, a lot of people believe that. Let's look at it this way: everybody says that um, we celebrate Christmas for the birth of Christ, but Christ wasn't born in in winter; he's born in spring. So a lot of people think and theorize that uh, the Christians timed uh, this holiday to celebrate Jesus' birth to coincide with the uh, Nordic solstice celebrations, and because they were so popular they were so popular and a lot of the stuff that they did to celebrate the winter festival we still do today the yule log i mean that the amount of food the type of foods we eat to celebrate the year ending is the same sort of foods that you'll see on your table today you know uh even the christmas tree i mean like it, a lot of things that you would find uh, the mistletoe mistletoe comes from the, uh, <laughs> norse mythology too I mean, um, it's rooted in it. So, you know, it, there's so much about Christmas itself that is more Norse than it is Christian, in my opinion. And we can yeah, argue right. with that. And, and that's true for a lot of Christian holidays that, um, you know, I mean, Easter um, is, is generally celebrated as the rise of Christ. Um, but uh, it, it really was more targeted towards covering up and, and kind of attracting Norse people um, from the spring equinox. That's why when we celebrate Easter, we celebrate eggs and we celebrate rabbits and we celebrate things that are of fertility because that is the, the season where fertility and growth happens. And that's what they used to celebrate then. And nowadays, a lot of those patterns have been adopted. A uh, good example there is just simply the name, Oster. Well, that's Easter. <laughs> and uh, there's a story about Oster taking a walk in the frozen, horrible wasteland and saw a little bird that was freezing to death and said, oh, you, we, I'm going to do something to save it. So she turned it into a rabbit that could go underground and keep warm. Now you got a rabbit that lays eggs. Yeah, I mean, um, if we even go back, like, um, going back to Christmas again, because I just remember, I feel like we could do a whole episode on this thing, but, like... On um, holidays. Period. Yeah, holidays. Like, everybody knows of the reindeer that fly from Santa, right? But oh. do, you ever, do you ever wonder where that even came from? It actually comes from the Yule Goat, and basically it's a legend about Thor, um, about Thor riding in the sky, being pulled by two goats on a um, was a, on a wagon. He was dragged by a wagon through the sky by two goats, and that is where <laughs> this is the story of how Santa got his flying reindeer is by this story by the Yule goat. So it's uh, also part of what synchronized into it. I mean. Well, first off, it's interesting that Thor would uh, bash these goats to death every night, eat them, and bring them back to life afterwards. Oh, yeah. But what was also synchronized into it was Odin's trip across the night sky as a precursor to the wild hunt of winter, uh, riding, I have to say this right, Slefnir, his eight-legged horse. Oh, yeah. Can't think of its name. To, but anyway, that's a another precursor to Santa and his sleigh, and the uh, one of the reasons it was reindeer too. And now we're we're I'm kind of shifting a little bit into some Siberian mythology, 
but it heavily influenced the Norse too, was that the reindeer would uh, be critical in discovering the magical mushrooms, the fly allergaic, which were red and white mushrooms that we still put on our Christmas trees. And these reindeers would eat it and jump around like mad because they were high off their antlers. And they would they'd say, oh, these reindeer are flying, man. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like we could do a whole episode of this because, like, now I'm getting to, like, how, basically, Santa is Odin. Yeah. That's who he is. Like, when the Vikings took over England, uh, he was introduced to them as, um, what was it, the old... Um, Father Christmas? Father Christmas, yeah. So, that's where... Santa is Odin, guys. That's That's... If you're wonder where like Odin, what Odin looks like, just look at Santa because that's basically him dressed up in a red robe, and that's who he's depicted after. And and after why he ate his huge feast and he was bigger. The yeah. Father Christmas was the uh, figure representing the feast before he became a Santa Claus. And why was he wearing red? Well, that was because uh, what I was talking about with the fly arrow red and white magic mushrooms. The shamans of Siberia that influenced a lot of Nordic stuff, well, they would dress like their mushrooms when they delivered it down the only way into a house that was snowed in through the chimney. He would deliver these dried gifts, which when you ate them, you became hot and you could survive. What do you guys think? Do you think we should do like a whole episode on this? Like maybe yep. next? Holiday. Because I think there's so much into it. Um, we did get a question by uh, Paul who said, can we do, like, episodes per god? And I think that's a great idea where we'll just dive into each of the gods. Definitely. Yeah. Um, well, before so, we move on too far past the original core concept, I wanted to get out of the way a kind of boring material. Nobody's talked about vegetables. They did eat food. Nobody likes eating vegetables. Yeah, I know, but they did. And uh, besides what they could farm, there's a lot of scavenging, obviously. They had turnips and celery and spinach and cabbage and radishes and peas and beans. And they had lots of vegetables at their disposal, leeks and onions. And in fact, even I know we think of this as an Asian thing, but they did consume a lot of seaweed as a salty flavoring for their vegetable dishes. Hmm. Right, and and all of that again depended on um, what what they had access to, because there were certain parts that um, were particularly rocky terrain. So they did a lot of uh, low rooting um, vegetables, like um, uh, well, I don't want to say lettuce, but lots of greens and things that uh, grew above ground. But then in other places where um, they had the soil to do it, they did have a lot of um, squash and larger things. They did have fruits. They did have uh, turnips and potatoes and all those other things because, I mean, legitimately, they, they realized that they needed to eat them in order to survive, and they ate what they could. And a lot of and, imports, obviously. So, yeah. Right. I think one of the things that, um, that you know, kind of coincides with the whole idea of a feast as well, when they're bringing... Um, foods and, and, and goods back from whether they were going out Viking um, <laughs> was uh, right they, they were they were being Vikings um, was you know they, they had alternatives to what they ate all the time because they did have a particularly standard diet um, that was limited by whatever, wherever they lived and whatever they had access to. Um, and one of the reasons why, you know, it's really hard to say like, oh, Vikings or Nordic people ate this or that or whatever was because they were over such a large space and they were constantly, you know, exploring, I guess is a less negative way to say it, but exploring new lands and um, finding new materials. Uh, and, and new places that they could grow different vegetables. But a lot of what they ate um, for most of the year, just because um, it, it was the, the climate that they had, was what we think of as um, fall vegetables. So you've got lots of squash and you've got lots of 
things Mushroom. that grow and mushrooms that grow in cooler climates um, just because that was the climate that they were in at the time. I have nothing to add about vegetables. I have nothing to add about vegetables. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't research this part. Oh. Uh, um, something I remember that kind of piqued my curiosity, but I couldn't find anything deeper about it, was the fact that they had uh, a handful of oils, and a lot of this probably was due to uh, imports and <clears throat> trade. Uh, but some of them included linseed oil, rapeseed oil, and not grape, but yeah, rapeseed oil. I don't really know what that is. Sounds wrong. It, but, it does. It's it's just a. I, I'm trying to remember which one it is, but it's an oil that we call by whatever it comes from now. It, it's a normal, uh, average oil that we still use regularly. Okay. There. All right. And the third one, which got my head scratching, was uh, hemp seed oil. They had. That's because so, hemp grows easily everywhere. Everywhere, and I'm curious. Did they ever use other parts of that plant? <laughs> I'm sure that they did. So rapeseed oil is basically canola oil. Oh, all right. Um, that's what it is. Thank you. Um, but um, I, I mean, it, it was pretty common in, in their feasts as well, along with drinking heavily, um, that they had different herbs that they would consume um, that would give them certain effects, like magic mushrooms or... Um, I mean, they, they grew a lot of hemp, and hemp is useful for a lot of uh, nutritional things, but um, if you can grow hemp, then you can grow marijuana as well. Right. Um, and, and so they, they used the material. I, I mean, everything it came down to is they used the materials they had at hand. Oh, yeah. Uh, that pretty much covers food, doesn't it? I I I think so. I think so too. Um, I mean, there's so much other stuff that they did eat. Like, of course, they've eaten stuff like um, shellfish and all that stuff. You know, they were really big on seafood. Um, you know, they liked to have porridges and gruel. Um, you know, they had the bread that we talked about. They made cheese, you know. Oh, yeah, the cheeses and dairies we kind of glossed over, didn't we? Yeah. Um, you know, but a lot of people believe that um, they created cheese. They were the first ones to create cheese. And, you know, there's other things like tavern food, you know. Um, and the idea of a tavern meal being your stew and your meat in the jug and hanging out and uh, the host is giving you as much food to fill your belly for the night as you pass through town um, came came from the Vikings. You know, a lot, a lot of the stuff that you read um, from Tolkien or in general of like mythology and fantasy are inspired by these group of people. And it's probably, I would say, they would have just as much influence on the modern world as the Romans did. Oh, absolutely. And uh, another thing that kind of made me scratch my head at how, how would it taste was the fact that they would pickle some fish and meats in leftover lactic acid from their dairy. Well, that's where I think they got the idea to make... Um cheese because um when you make cheese that's exactly what you do is you let it uh you use lactic acid to make the curds and whey so like uh, if i was to make i used to make um uh, mozzarella all the time and uh, i would have to use lactic acid inside um the mix to create the curds and whey to make mozzarella and that's why we used to do so i because of their heavy usage of it, I always believe that um, the, the the stories that they did created because there's no concrete evidence that they that, that they were the first ones to make it mm -hmm. or that. But just like you said, they they found that they have used a lot of 
lactic acid and since they use in these other applications it's not too far-fetched to think that they stumbled upon how to create cheese first yeah but how how would a chunk of pork preserved in lactic acid taste <laughs> i don't Ooh. well i mean <sighs> I, I, even that is it, it's not the same type of acid but it, there is a way to to cure and and treat meats um, and, and a lot of people still do this with fish that they put, um, citric acid instead of lactic acid on it, mm -hmm. but they do that to, I mean, you, you can legitimately cook meals, um, solely using acids, um, to break down the proteins inside so that, and, and kill off any bacteria because it creates a, an environment that the, the meat won't spoil. Um, and so they, they did a lot of that. And, and I, I, again, it kind of comes down to the resources they had, but they, they had animals that produced milk and they had the ability to make cheese, um, which lasted much longer in stores than just milk did. Um, and they didn't have any sort of pasteurization or anything that we have now to make it last for a significantly long time. But so, still, but yeah. Yeah, so they they use that for meats. They used it for um, they they used it to preserve the the dairy itself, um, and and it really just came down to a necessity, I think. But I think you're right. I'm really interested to know what that would taste like if you had meat that. I mean, afterwards they would cook it in stews or whatever with with hot stones and everything. But um, the the meat wouldn't spoil if it was stored. Um, in that particular way. All right. So, uh, I had a thought. Our two requests, uh, doing a holiday-focused or multiple holiday-focused show versus one on each deity. I think we should handle the gods first because the holiday stories involve them so much. I agree. I agree. Maybe we start with Odin and we go from there. Or maybe we vote. Maybe we'll vote on which god they want to hear about first. But I feel like. Yeah. But don't you think, like, for me, it's almost like in order to understand Thor or Loki, you have to know about their father. And if you. Mm -hmm. so... Yeah. Mm. Well, does anyone else. Else have anything to add about food and beverage? Mm. Well, I think we covered everything that was uh, on my checklist. Yeah, same here. Same. I think uh, we covered a good bunch. I mean, this. I think it's so. I mean, obviously, guys, this is a topic that we're never gonna be able to cover fully an hour. <laughs> 15 minutes span but you know it's just to give you a quick overview of how intricate their their lives were when it came to food and wine yep absolutely are there any questions uh coming in about grub uh let me see does anybody have any questions about what was discussed in this episode this is the opportunity to ask um those are the only two questions other people watching. Huh. There's some other conversation that I think Paul asked the Midgar Serpent. I'm not sure what that was for. Maybe that was during the meat talk. Mm, well, uh, that'll be that'll be covered, but that's that's going to require a bit of time for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty deep. Yeah. Yeah. No. We will definitely, definitely hit on that. Don't worry. I think that's it. I am. I, I feel like there's there's one quote from from Robert Pope that that just needs to be said. Of go ahead. Bobro smash his head for a good drink. <laughs> and and I feel like that's totally, totally true. I think you muted yourself, Justin. You can unmute yourself. Oh. I saw that too. Because I can't unmute you. Um, 
What is he saying? All right. I, I, I think he, he is, is figuring out how to unmute. Okay. From our previous conversations, I think um, Hangouts is a little bit new to him still. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll get but, it for our next episode then, I guess. For sure. All right, um, yeah. We'll figure out what the next episode is. We'll let you guys know what it is, but for now, I think we can end it here. Do you guys want to say anything as a sign out before we go? Uh, we'll see you next time in Midgard. <laughs> yeah. See you guys next time, Midgard. Oh, he said they used to. Um, what do you say? They did harvest eggs by making ropes and rappelling down the, the cliffs. I thought that was neat. Oh, hmm. right, because there were lots of birds that would live on the side of cliffs, and so they would. Yeah. Hell down to, to scavenge for eggs. Yeah, and, and I mean, they. I, I think one last thing um, that I, always, I I found particularly interesting, um, and I didn't realize that this was still a thing today until there was something with um, with Gordon Ramsay about it. But um, they used to eat puffin. Really, which That's is not an animal. Yeah, which is not an, I mean, it makes sense. It's an animal that they had access to that lived in cold, cold climates. But that's something that I wouldn't consider as a, a, a food today. Um, but I wouldn't consider eating horse or dog on purpose either. Pine so, bark. Or pine bark. So, anyway, I just like ran in them extras at the end of the video, I guess. Um, Paul said he would like to hear about all the other realms, like Hell and stuff. For sure. Oh, that's going to be in the mythologies and religion focused one. Yeah. Definitely. Helheim. Helheim, yeah. Hell was the woman that was in charge of Helheim. Sometimes with an A, sometimes not. Yeah. Sometimes Hella. Hella. Uh, yeah. One of Loki's offspring.